thanks so much for coming this evening. I'm really excited to be here. I'm just kicking off the book tour for Foodopoly this week. So I've been thinking about writing a book for a long time. Um, the Foodopoly is really what's making people so sick and unhealthy in our society. And in my day job at Food and Water Watch, we run into the cabal of companies that are really dictating food and farm policy in this country. But when you ask most people why, you know, so many children drink uh, twice as many sodas as they did in 1970, or why 35 percent of adults are obese and 17 percent of children, uh, most people say uh, it's kind of a shorthand. They'll say, well, it's the subsidies. Um, people don't really know what's causing the problems with our food system. So what really set me off to read, uh, to write Foodopoly um, were a couple of events that happened in a weekend in 2011. I was traveling to a conference uh, out in the Midwest as part of my job at Food and Water Watch, and I stopped to interview some farmers for an article that I was writing. And over the course of my work at Food and Water Watch, I, I get to talk to a lot of farmers, but my questions uh, were about how well they were doing, because we look at the census of agriculture statistics, and we know from those statistics that farmers aren't doing so well. So one farmer in particular was telling me a really heartbreaking story. He was thinking about selling his farm. He's a commodity farmer, he used to be an independent livestock grower, because in states like Iowa, Missouri, people used to have diversified farms where they raised, you know, some vegetables, had some livestock, they grew their own feed. And that's just simply not possible anymore. And he doesn't have enough land to really make um, money from commodities. And so he's going to sell this farm that's been in his family for, you know, 200 years. It was a really uh, very sad story. The next day I was at a conference, a food conference, and I was listening to a, uh, a panel on commodities, and there was a well-known and very well-intentioned food advocate there speaking. And this person was asked during the question period, why is organic food so expensive? And why are people growing so many commodities instead of organic food? And this person answered, and you know, with a straight face, it's, bef it's because farmers get huge subsidies, and um, because of the subsidies, they don't grow organic broccoli. And then she went on to basically call uh, farmers greedy welfare queens. I mean, not using that language, but that was the image. So I felt, I felt really saddened and upset about this, because a better answer would have been, because we don't have a fair market for farmers to sell into, and Midwestern farmers really don't have the equipment to grow vegetables or the climate to compete with California or all of the places in the developed world where our fruits and vegetables are coming from. So I went home that weekend and I started writing the outline for Foodopoly. So let's start by talking about subsidies. I mean, this is not a very um, popular issue, and people often, uh, their eyes glaze over, but it's a very important issue. Now, I am not here to justify the subsidy system. Obviously, it's bad public policy. But blaming all of the ills on the food system on the 17-year-old subsidy system distracts from a lot of the more meaningful issues. And the subsidy system is a symptom of what's wrong with our food system. It's a Band-Aid that covers up bad agriculture policies that benefit the biggest food companies in the country and in the world. And we need to reform the food system and the, the marketplace before we just get rid of subsidies. In fact, if we just get rid of subsidies, we're going to lose a very high percentage of small and mid-sized farms. And we really need farmers to be partners in fixing our food system. We don't want to demonize farmers. They're, they're victims of this system as well. So I'm going to ask you to stick with me while I go through some farm history and statistics that are really important if you want to understand how the food system that's making us sick 
really operates. Now, we know that, uh, that experts from all sides of the political spectrum uh, often point to subsidies and getting rid of subsidies as kind of a silver bullet. In fact, you often hear that it's the single most important thing that we could change. You'll often hear that uh, only the largest farms get subsidies while small farms get nothing. Remember that saying that uh, Mark Twain really popularized? Lies, damn lies, and statistics? Well, it's pretty true when you're looking at farm numbers and statistics. And that's really the case with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's statistics. The root problem with this analysis on subsidies is that the statistics that are used by USDA uh, assert that we have 2.2 million farmers. Well, the agency's probably very embarrassed about the lousy job that they've been doing because they're kind of lying with those statistics. A close look at the numbers shows that USDA's numbers count the one-third of those 2.2 million entities that have sales of under $1,000, and two-thirds of those entities have sales of under $10,000. Those aren't profits, those are sales. So that's like the small businesses down the road from my family's farm that actually I don't run, my husband runs. Um, I have a neighbor who has a, a hobby vineyard. He may sell eight or $10,000 of grapes a year to a, a winemaker down the road. I'm not sure if he, if he even um, sells that many. And then I have a friend who lives kind of close who has a flower business during the summer. I know she makes under $1,000 in the summer growing flowers for some local restaurants. She does it because she enjoys it. These are not farmers. These aren't people who consider themselves farmers. They are often retirees, and they shouldn't be counted as farmers when we're looking at these subsidies because why would we subsidize small hobby farmers? Now, it is true that the largest farms receive the largest share of farm subsidies and that some politicians and urban residents really benefit very unfairly from subsidies. But we can't let this critique overshadow the fact that small and mid-sized farms are suffering and that they rely on these government programs as a critical safety net. We sure don't want to throw out the baby as the bathwater, with the bathwater, as my mother used to say. So after accounting for all the costs of farming, small and medium farms net just over $19,000 a year. That's from the USDA's most recent statistics. The government programs make up nearly half of that amount, and earnings from off-farm jobs make up the rest of the household's income. The income of these full-time farmers is 19% below the U.S. average. Farm income isn't keeping up with the cost of producing crops, even though the, the price for corn and soy is higher since 2007. The ever-inflating cost of seeds is a really good example. A few, I'm sure you all know that a few major chemical and pharmaceutical giants now domina dominate the seed industry. These are companies like Monsanto, and the prices have skyrocketed. Corn seed prices rose 32 percent since the fiscal crisis, and soybean seeds are up 24 percent. Also, the cost of fuel, fertilizer, feed, and other inputs make farming pretty expensive venture, not to mention the bad weather and drought that are making it really a, a roller coaster ride for farmers. Small and mid-sized farms operate at a really slim margin. And if the subsidy program is eliminated without creating a fair market that farmers can sell into, we're going to lose a lot more farms. These are the family-run operations that are really going to be critical for transitioning into a sustainable food system. So what happens when these farms go bankrupt? And we've had uh, thousands and thousands of them in the last two decades that have gone bankrupt. In the U.S., out of the fewer than one million farms, 
There are 115,000.